19 of them. Okay. So you say that if people would be more individuated and more conscious of their emotions and more com comfortable being alone, a huge percentage of narcissistic abuse would be avoidable. And if yes, how, how so? How do you come to this conclusion? Narcissists leverage, leverage your unresolved conflicts. They leverage your cravings and needs, apropos our unrecorded uh, section about the femme fatale. See? Narcissists are absent, exactly like the femme fatale. Uh, they are about absence. It is the narcissist's absence that allows you to, to, to become anything you want within the narcissistic shared fantasy. The narcissist... The narcissist lets you lets you idealize yourself and, and project yourself into him and then lets you see yourself through his gaze and fall in love with yourself uh, in the idealized form. It is any affair with the narcissist is uh, autoerotic, is masturbatory, is uh, self love, self infatuation and self limerence. Because there's nobody there. The narcissist doesn't exist. It's a shape, shape-shifting void. It's a simulation of a human being. And not a very good one at that. So clearly you're interacting with yourself. You're in a hall of mirrors. But people tend to self-deceive because they have no boundaries. Because they're terrified that if they don't please others, something horrible may happen. This is called catastrophizing. Because they have been wounded in, in childhood, and they need to be wounded again and again and again because they've learned to, to, to identify pain with love. The narcissist gives you all these services, free of charge often. Gives you all these things. The narcissist is a pathological, pathological uh, playground or a playground for your pathologies. And so healthy people... After a while, a short while, they would walk away. They would never bond with a narcissist or attach. They would not fall for the uh, idealization phase. They would not want to see themselves idealized through the narcissist gaze because they've had a functional childhood with a loving mother. They don't need to be loved again as an idealized baby. You know, They don't need to replay. They don't need, they don't need to have a second chance at life. The narcissist comes to you and says, if you give me your life, I will give you a second chance at life. It's a, as we said, a Faustian deal. So I realize all your wishes and, and make all your broken dreams come true. I will heal you. I will mend you. I'll put you back together. And I'll put you back together in a much better version of yourself. I will better you. I'm the path to improvement. I'm the path, I'm a prog progressive path. All you have to do is is promise me to to promise to give me full control over your life. Promise me to let me own your life. You just need to be owned, and then I will take care of all the rest. Now, this is of course the implicit or the explicit contract between people and dictators. The dictator sends a similar message. All you have to do is give me full control, and then you don't need to worry about anything. You will have no responsibility. You will never be guilty for anything because all the decisions are mine. You're going to suspend both your disbelief and your agency. And by doing this, you will also get rid of shame and guilt and responsibility and accountability. These are burdens. Jean-Paul Sartre said that the reason for angst, the reason for the existential type of anxiety, is because you're forced to make choices. He said, in life, you have to make choices. You have to choose. And this is very, it creates anxiety, creates angst. The dictator and the narcissist, who is a cult, narcissist is a leader of a cult. Thank you very much. A narcissist is a dictator. Only his kingdom is, is you, the intimate partner. So the dictatorial message, the authoritarian message is, if you stop to, if you suspend your being, you will gain happiness, or at least you will avoid negative emotions, like guilt and shame. And it's an irresistible proposition in a world which fosters anxiety, negative affectivity, envy, hatred, rage, anger. It's in a world which constantly provokes you to feel bad. Here I come and tell you, give me 
give me your life, give me control over you, and I guarantee you that you will never feel bad again. Even if you wish, I will. Uh, you, you can regard me as a reflecting pond or, or a mirror, and you can see in me whatever you want. So why not? And so people fall for this, time and again. Do you, we we have a democratic wave which lasts thirty years, and then people fall for it again. We go from one relationship relationship which lasts, which lasts seven years, and we fall into another one, which is a replica of. We learn nothing. Because learning is is not involved in this process. It's far more basic. It's far more primitive. It's atavistic and also harks back to early childhood. You know, all this self help industry and psychology and they about they will teach you. They will, they, you you can learn from your experience. You can learn from your experience on how to make coffee. Yes, maybe many people don't even manage this. But you absolutely cannot learn from your experience when it comes your, to your relationships, to your psychological dynamics, to mistakes that you make in life, to wrong, wrong mate selection, <clears throat> to bizarre choices, to self-destructiveness. To, there's no learning in any of this. In any of this. So what is the path of recovery if there is any? There's no recovery also. And that is why people don't like what I have to say. The question about recovery is an American question. Americans think that every problem has a solution and every disease has a cure. So they were pissed off that there wasn't a cure for COVID immediately. And why should I put a mask? You should find a solution for me. The truth, the sad truth about life and reality is that extremely few problems have solutions. Most problems do not have solutions, and most diseases don't have a cure. What happens to you gradually is you get habituated, so you suffer less, or you avoid. So you have a bad relationship, and then the second bad relationship, you suffer less, and then maybe you will say, I'm not going to have relationships again, and you remain with Netflix and two cats, and that's the rest of your life. That's the truth. 31% of adults in the industrialized world have chosen to not have relationships. They're lifelong singles. Gradually, this is becoming more and more common. People are atomized. They are self-sufficient. Technology allows them to, be, to need no one, so they don't need anyone. And they close the doors, and they disappear into their own bubbles. This is a, solu this is a practical way to cope. With, but to say, uh, I've had one bad relationship with a narcissist, now I know how to identify a narcissist, how to avoid a narcissist, how to manage a narcissist. How, this is counterfactual. That is not true. You didn't end up with a narcissist because you didn't know things, because there was a lack of learning or some ignorance. You ended up with a narcissist because this is who you are. There is no such thing as a bad partner. No such thing as a bad partner. Every partner, never mind how bad, is responsive to your psychological needs. Otherwise, they would not become your partner. End of story. So that, that brings me to another question about, um, about the responsibility of the victims. I'm not answering anything before I have my coffee. Let's go. Let's do it. <laughs> you want to put it on pause? Uh, no. I mean, it's fun. We're, we're drinking it's fun. coffee live. Okay. Part of the fun, yeah. All right. It's performance. Performance art. Performance art. Okay, yeah. Performance art. Yeah. If I can learn it. You notice, you notice my boundary set, setting, assertiveness. Wonderful. Healthy, healthy. I was Very healthy. Very healthy. Yeah. I was healthy. Right. No, uh, ma no, um, no money, no money. I can manage, hopefully. I manage this. Okay. I, mean, I know we're men. We're not supposed to manage, but still. Yeah. We can okay. manage some things. Yeah, we're switching gender roles here. <laughs> <laughs> Right. It's a very feminine coffee. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. I didn't cook the coffee. I'm just serving it. Yeah, yeah. Excuse us, <laughs> excuse us. <laughs> yeah. No. You don't want coffee? No milk. No, just drink. Okay. You're welcome. Oh, the only time I'm near, I, I become nearly religious is when I drink coffee. 
Okay, there must be a God. There's a question. To. There's a question for your, your spirituality later on, so yes. we can touch on that. There must be a God <laughs> to have created this. Yeah. Well, if he created coffee, then he, he created everything. No, we will see. Uh, that's a, yeah. just, it's an interesting. I'm not, sure about, I'm not sure about everything, but we definitely must have created coffee. Okay. Mm -hmm. He just jumped in to do the coffee bit, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anything you guys need? You don't have coffee. Okay. <laughs> Don't forget the tip. Yeah. Yeah, where were we? Okay, so this was live, you know, performance. Coffee. Yes. Coffee service uh, by a man in Budapest. So anyway, um, about the responsibility of victims. Do they have any? Because remember you saying, once you're in the net, you, there's not much you can do. But then you also talk, it's a really beautiful and inspiring uh, monologue of yours about individuating and Yes, there is a certain kind of hope that you're not definitely going to be drowning in the well. So where's, where's the truth? Or When I said there's no learning and there's no solution, it simply means that you cannot approach the same situation or recreate the same situation and expect, expect a different outcome because you, will have, because you have gained some knowledge mm. before. In other words, knowledge and learning will not change the outcome of identical situations. End of story. <laughs> However, you can work on yourself. Rather than work on other people, or for example, to say, from now on I'm going to choose uh, partners who are not narcissists. Right. That is the wrong orientation. That is outward orientation. You must never attempt to change the environment. Not even your actions in the environment. This is wrong orientation. The only thing you can change eff efficaciously to some extent is yourself. You should change yourself. Naturally, what will follow is different choices, different outcomes, and so on and so forth. Sure. Now, some of the self-help industry tell you to change yourself, but the, the orientation is still outward. Like, I will change myself in order to make more money, or I will change myself in order <clears> to <throat> choose the right mate. Or, and, so, and this is still outward orientation. If you are goal-oriented in the process of self-improvement or, or self-change, this is an orientation which will guarantee failure. You, the only reason to Im improve yourself is yourself. Nothing external, not money, not work, not other people, not your mates, your, not your children, not your nation, not, none of this. Only you. So... Victims are not responsible because responsibility implies an interaction with an external entity of some kind. You're responsible to the state, you're responsible to your own children. So they're not responsible for anything. But they would do well to work on themselves without any goal in mind. And one of the things they can do is they can individuate. It's they need to work on separation and then become... Uh, who they were meant to become. This can be done. There are techniques, well-known techniques. They work well, and so on and so forth. But here we come again across a hindrance or an impediment. People are terrified of separating. We live in a society where people are enmeshed. Enmeshment is the common form of relationship management. Enmeshment can be in many forms. It can be financial, it can be emotional, and so on. But there's always some form of enmeshment going on. People seek to merge and fuse. And this is the outcome of the wrong messaging sent by the Romantic movement in the 19th century. Up until the 19th century, the concept of love and relationships was transactional on the one hand, but was much healthier in many other ways. The Romantic movement, starting more or less in, in the beginning, at the beginning of the 19th century, and more or less in Germany, of course, where else, and then spread to the United Kingdom, <clears throat> this Romantic movement broadcast you, said to you, that if you don't experience a highly specific type of love, it's not love. And this highly specific type of love requires your disappearance, it requires your annulment or even annihilation and reappearance or rebirth through the agency of the loved one. So it was a highly religious approach to love because it was the story of Jesus Christ. You needed to crucify yourself so that you can be resurrected through your love and the loved one. He was your agent 
of liberation and, and so on. So, and this is, we got stuck with this. We got stuck with this. And so today, romantic love is about merger and fusion. And so people are terrified. If When you come to someone and say, you need to learn to separate, you need to learn to individuate, you need to learn to put firm boundaries and healthy boundaries, you need to impose them firmly but not aggressively, you need to, the hidden or the implicit message is you need to be left, you need to stay alone, you need to be lonely, which is of course not true, yes, but they don't dare to go there because they're terrified that the end result will be, they'll be left alone. So they keep, they prefer dysfunctional, hurtful, damaging relationships to the alternative of being a strong person, but a lonely one. And it didn't help that extensions of the Romantic movement, for example, Nietzsche, broadcast exactly the same message. Nietzsche said, if you heal yourself, if you become a superman, ubermensch, but uh, then you will be alone. He said, loneliness or aloneness prove that you are now a superman. So the message was, there are two options. Either you are a weakling, spineless, um, societally controlled uh, idiot, and then you, you have relationships, and, or you work on yourself, you work, you, you work on a new morality, you evolve, next stage in evolution, you become a superman, but then you're alone. That means you will never have a relation. That was a message of Nietzsche. That was a message of Kierkegaard, actually. Kierkegaard said, you, if you want to, to attain happiness, or you need to make a leap of faith. Kierkegaard was religious. He suggested God as the alternative. So you need to make a leap of faith. But Kierkegaard said that a leap of faith would put you apart from humanity. The first thing Kierkegaard did, Kierkegaard did after he wrote about a leap of faith, he went to his fiancée and he said, I cannot marry you. I'm sorry, I'm calling off the engagement because I discovered a new principle of a leap of faith and it requires that I be alone. So, And then you have the existentialist who told you that man is alone. Man has the need, the condition of being human is that you need to make choices and so on alone. No one can help you, nothing. You need to be authentic. And authentic means to set yourself apart from society, totally apart, to never emulate any role, to never work, uh, fulfill expectations of other people. To, or in, other, in other words, for 150 years, we are we are, the message that we are receiving from philosophy, from religion, from you name it, the message is either you work on yourself, you improve yourself, you evolve as a human being, you grow and develop, but then you must be alone. Or you give in and give up, and that would guarantee your integration in society. But you have to. The price is you, you know, you you stagnate. Right, but then this would say. I mean, the contrast is so extreme that this would mean that a, there is no such thing as a healthy relationship because you're either dependent or you're completely autonomous, and there's no middle ground. Yes. Which clearly there is. I mean, the, for some people there is. I mean, it, the the wrong message. Uh, of all these disciplines was that relationships uh, require not um, compromise or negotiation, but sacrifice. The core, the core word that underlay all relationships was sacrifice, and that is a religious thing, of course. So that's why I'm saying the model was Jesus. You, in a relationship, you need to sacrifice something, something small, big, but it's yeah. based on sacrifice. Well, of course, a good relationship is not based on giving, it's based on taking. Now, that's, that's a no-no. You're not supposed to say this. This is selfish, this is narcissistic, this is entitled. You're not supposed to say this. But a good relationship is not about giving. It's about taking. And what do you take? You take the separateness of, of your partner. Good relationships are based on pushing the loved one away not on merging with the loved one. A good mother pushes her child away. If she doesn't push her child away, he will never separate. He will never become an individual and never be happy in his entire life. He will be stunted. He will be a narcissist or I don't know what. A mother's main role 
main number one and two and three is to push the child away. All our love relationships are recreations of the primordial maternal interaction. Our role within relationships is to push the other away. When we push the other away, we allow that other person separateness, boundaries, and self-actualization of potential. We give the other person the impetus to walk away into new experiences and, new, and to develop and to evolve. But we are told exactly the opposite. We are told that in relationships, we should pull the partners, partner towards us. We should give all the time, actually bribe, bribe the partner. It's corruption. These are corrupt relationships. You know. What do we take from the? What should we take from good relationships? We should take the partner's separateness. The partner's go, partner goes out to the world and brings the world to us. His separateness guarantees the richness of the relationship. The partner contributes her private, non-couple experiences to the couple, and. And each partner takes these experiences. It's all about taking. It's like the two partners go out to the world and bring the world to the table, and then each one of them takes the other's experiences. They share, basically. It's sharing, but it's sharing that is based essentially on taking. So and how is then true intimacy created then in this situation? There is nothing more intimate than having access to another person's experience. Nothing more intimate. Even sex is an experience. So, it, when done <clears throat> properly, it is the most intimate, the pinnacle of intimacy. When done wrongly, then it, it can separate, actually. So, we see, for example, that the attitude to sex today is wrong, because sex is, is cast as giving. So, when we interview women who participate in casual sex and one-night stands, and we ask them, what were you doing there? They say they wanted to give to the partner, to the male partner, even in one night stands. They wanted to give to the male partner. Mm. And so, even this is based on giving. It's a wrong orientation, but none of this can be said out loud. None of this. No mainstream media will publish this. No one will think of it even. You will, be, you will lose your job and your, mm. te your tenure as a professor. You want none of it. There's enormous censorship everywhere. Enormous censorship everywhere. And you could ask why. Why? Why would we censor, censor such people? Because the concept of giving is intimately linked to consumerism. It's a capitalist concept. The concept of taking is essentially free agency. So, in the concept of, of giving, the partners consume each other. They become each other's commodity. You know, it's like, what can you give me? Why should I stay in this relationship? What am I getting out of it? Mm. You know, it's a transactional attitude of you are my, you're a product to me and I'm a product to you. Mm. And we both consume each other. It's integrated in the, in the psychology and philosophy of consumerism. So consequently, um, if you offer an alternative model, you would be undermining uh, the foundations of capitalism. Because capitalism started off, I'm sorry I'm meandering all over the place, but it's interesting to link all these things. Yeah. Capitalism started off, capitalism started in probably, if you want to go very far, let's say in the 13th century. In the 13th century, there was a new arrangement, new group of, of, uh, of states or pseudo-states, and they created something called Solferheim. Solferheim was a, a, a regional custom area, exactly like the European Union. And the Solferheim included the Baltic states and Netherlands, today's Netherlands and so on and so forth. And so because there was a unified customs area, trade flourished and exploded and required finance. In come the Jews and the Lombards and so on and so forth, and they opened the first banks. Marco Polo used a bank. When he was traveling, he used a bank. He had checks, the equivalent of today of checks. Yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> so capitalism initially was about facilitating exchange of goods and services via common means of exchange. It had no philosophy behind it, none. 
No one says capitalism is good, capitalism is bad. There were alternative methods of, of economic organization and they were perfectly acceptable and they coexisted and they were not competing. There were no politics attached to, to any of this. Right. But then capitalism got um, poisoned and corrupted. It started with the Industrial Revolution. The concept of growth, economic growth, was in, in, uh, introduced into capitalism. And capitalism became focused on securing economic growth, more or less in the 18th century. You read Ricardo, you read Smith, they d begin to discuss economic growth. Why, why is growth bad? The concept of growth is very poisonous, very toxic. Why is it? Because in order to secure growth, you must increase consumption all the time. So consumption became the organizing principle of, of economics. And together with it, there, there was a new ideology intended to interpolate. Interpolation was a concept invented by Louis Althusser, who was a new Marxist philosopher. And Althusser said the advertising industry is intended to interpolate us, intended to push us to consume. And this was the birth of consumerism. Create needs, right? Create artificial needs yeah. in, in us via, <coughs> via essentially brainwashing. And there, were, there was Guy Debord and many other philosophers, but the, the main one was Althusser. And so, so consumer, consumerism became the ideology of, of consumption, which was, became the foundational pillar of corrupted, malignant capitalism. I'm a capitalist by conviction, don't misunderstand, but this is malignant capitalism. But you can't, in human psychology, you, there's, you can't entertain more than one organizing principle at a time. That's a maxim in psychology. If you have an organizing uh, uh, principle, you will apply it everywhere. Organ just to explain what is an organizing principle. An organizing principle is a way to interpret the life, to interpret life and reality so that it gives you a sense of meaning, purpose, direction, goal orientation, and makes sense of the world. This is called an organizing principle. When you have an organizing principle, you can't entertain two because they would automatically compete. The minute people adopted consumerism as an ideology and organizing principle, they applied it everywhere. And they applied it to relationships, of course. And so every, they converted, they objectified their intimate partners and rendered them products. Consumption had infiltrated human relations and then took over human relations. And today we consume each other like commodities. And the minute you consume, the minute you, con you consume each other, it's about what you give me. It's about giving. What do you give me? What can you give me? Why should I stay in this relationship? And so the threshold of tolerance in relationship collapsed. My grandmother would have tolerated a lot from my grandfather. I'm not talking about abuse. It doesn't have to be abuse. Certain traits, certain quirks, certain personality, idiosyncrasies. She would have tolerated much more. But if it's all about consumption, what can you give me? You are just a product then, you know, I will change to version 14 of you. Or I will replace you with Android. You are an iPhone, I'll replace you with Android. So the, the level of tolerance in relationship collapsed completely. It was her trigger to replace partners. Like, you know, a better, better product. And we need, to, we need to go back. We need to go back and decommoditize people. Stop regarding people as products. And the only way to do this is to separate there's the only way for me not to see you as a product, not to see you as a source of giving, is to realize that you are separate from me and to let you separate. To How to do that? Push you away. There's no other way. I push you away, I give you personal space, I give you personal time, I give you the opportunity to explore, to develop, and you will be so grateful to me that your love will increase and you will come back to me and share with me the new riches mm -hmm. that you had found, the Marco Polo, your Marco Polo travels. And this would make our togetherness even more, you know, flourishing and, and, and wonderful. And Rumi said it long before me, when he said that if you want the bird, you should set her free. 
That's exactly what came to my mind as well. Also, there's a guy here that's trying to kill himself. Just for you to understand, the only word I got was Igen. Um, what they're saying is that they we need to vacate the room. We need to vacate. We can continue in another office if we want. Is that okay with you? Yeah, sure. Okay. I'm not turning anything off because I discovered that people like to have a view behind the scenes. Okay, now they will. <laughs> you're, um, Christina, you're, you're the audience. Do, do you find what we're talking about interesting or? Mm, okay. Yeah? It's pretty vast. It's pretty, 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 we're conquering a lot of ground. It's really interesting. I will consume the coffee because it's free, and then we. Oh, there's some. <laughs> no, joke. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I only have some data, so I'm fine. Maybe Sam is helping me on this stuff. Oh, no, no, no. Something. Mm -hmm. Ah, maybe with the the water and the coffee. But the rest is okay. So here we are, moving to another room. You can see my neck. Because this is my neck. <laughs> Looks much better than my face, mind you. Thank you, sorry. I think it's really bad. Let's try it. Again. So for this, that is the room. They always do the yeah. yes, uh, we, are, we are your guests. Uh, we are. We are sorry that we are <laughs> bothering you. Please. It is very nice. Okay. So that was a nice deep dive into relationships and and capitalism and um, an exchange. I don't know. I like I like to collect things. I think one of the major problems in in, in, in of today is that people remain pigeonholed. The pigeonholed, you know, they, they never connect things, but yeah. everything affects everything. Absolutely. Philosophy affects economics, economics affects relationship, relation, everything is interconnected. We, we, just, we just pretend that we are isolated, but we're never isolated. Also, I think pop culture is brainwashing us into this enmeshed, I can't live without you, yeah. you are the air that I breathe, you know, all these wonderful but you have cheesy that. love songs. Mm. They are hymns of codependence. Of course. You know, so no wonder people... Of course, mass, mass culture um, always reflects mores and conventions of, of the time. It's, it's never deviant. It's never revolutionary. It's, it always reflects uh, the current thinking. So, Especially yeah, mainstream culture. Mainstream culture. Yeah. Mass culture. Mass I'm culture. not talking about subcultures. You always have subcultures where the revolutionary, revolutionary ferment starts. But the main yeah. mainstream is... Uh, but you know, this this uh, 18th century, 19th century, you had similar songs. Similar. Mm -hmm. They were not on ra radio or something, but you had similar songs. Yeah. Troubadours. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. 
we'll be jumping around subjects which I think are important, going a little bit back to narcissistic abuse and then when you realize you are in that situation and uh, you have given a, perhaps a full interpretation, a 360 degree interpretation to when you know, you go. There's no real, there's no saving, there's no r really uh, uh, saving the situation. Um, why is this no contact rule which you have defined so important and what does it mean in its fullness? No contact is not, uh, people say my grandmother uh, invented no contact, not you, because my grandmother walked out on my grandfather. What? Good for your grandmother, but that's not no contact. No contact is a set, a set of 27 strategies, uh, which all together are intended to totally insulate you from any dimension and vector of narcissistic abuse. Narcissistic abuse is a chimera, it's a hydra, it, it's like water it would find the path of least resistance. So if you block one area, it will come through. You block the door, it comes through the window. You block the window, it will come from under the floor. You need to block everything. So there's 27 strategies on how to do that. And you must implement all of them simultaneously and uncompromisingly. Um, it's about keeping the narcissist uh, away from you and away from anyone uh, who matters to you and if there's no other choice because for example you have children together or something working only through intermediaries so he's allowed to, to talk only to your lawyer or to your accountant and they have instructions on how to filter his messages so they should get rid of all the emotional side and so on. they should just convey so it's it, it requires training professionals around you and you know it's a lot of work no contact is a lot of work it's not just walking or walking Away. There's another issue, of course. You can get rid of the narcissist, or the narcissist much more often gets rid of you, but he's still in your mind. You have an introject of the narcissist. You have his voice in your mind. It speaks to you. There is a period of prolonged grief after the narcissist is gone because you are grieving multiple dimensions and aspects of the relationship. You're grieving him, of course you are grieving the broken dream, the shared fantasy. You are bring, uh, grieving yourself through his gaze. You will never see yourself again the same way. You are grieving who you could have been or you could have become had you not met him. The damage is enormous. So you're grieving this, etc., etc. So it, there are so many aspects of grief that in most cases the grief is prolonged. Prolonged grief syndrome has been just included in the DSM and there's a text revision of the DSM published a few weeks ago mm -hmm. and they included finally prolonged grief syndrome. It's being in grief for a period longer than one year. That's prolonged grief. All, all relationships with narcissists end with prolonged grief. I have never, I haven't come across a single exception. And not only is it prolonged grief, but you continue to interact with the introject of the narcissist in your mind and you can't shut it off. There's no effective way to shut it off. There's no effective way to shut it off because the narcissist uh, creates a mind mesh. He, he, because he actually is absent, he is able to infiltrate you, he is able to render you the totality of the relationship. So, because there's nobody there, you kind of flow into all the spaces of the relationship. You invent the narcissist. I'm trying to, how to communicate absence is very difficult. Mm -hmm. You invent the narcissist. There's nobody there, ever. There was ne never anybody there. This is something the victims must understand. You were not chosen because there was no one there to choose you. You were not special because there was no one there to appreciate your specialness. There is nobody there. It's an absence, it's a void. It's a howling, it's a black hole. But exactly like a black hole, around the black hole, all the objects are affected by the black hole's gravity. So similarly, you change your trajectory, you change your mass, you, you become a different type of object. It is this, it is his absence that shapes you. And because Normal, healthy human beings don't know how to cope with absence. You invent him. 
you simply come up with him. He is, in other words, a figment of your mind. And so because it is you interacting with you, <laughs> then you can't get rid of you. The only option, it seems, to get rid of the narcissist in your mind is to go out of your mind. Your mind is gone, and he's gone. Otherwise, no. It's an infestation. He's in all empty spaces. He's in all spaces of your mind. Another solution, which is a little more benign than going out of your mind, is to separate and individuate. That's another solution. That's a lengthy and super difficult process because it's very frightening. Separation, you need to separate not from any real person, but you need to separate from uh, maternal introjects in your mind. You need to separate from your mind, in effect. Elements of your mind, known as introjects. You need to separate from them. And then once you have separated from them, you need to become something distinct from them. It feels a lot like developing schizophrenia or multiple personality. For a while, it feels that way. But at the end of this process, you will, you will have gone through something known as constellation or integration. All the elements of your mind come together and they form a unity, which is then known as the authentic self. Most victims of narcissists have de deficiencies and deficits in separation and individuation. Narcissist takes advantage of this and he forces them to merge or fuse or enmesh. And so you need to uh, reverse the process. So basically, if you try to put a positive spin on this, coming out of such an abusive situation is a chance for you to be reborn yes. or return to your original self. Which it's is a, a, it's a growth, it. growth inducing experience if you, if you <coughs> handle it properly. So some victims will tell you um, it was a blessing because I, I changed. I, I grew up, I became mature, I, I, now I have boundaries, I discovered myself. I, it's a small minority of victims, but these victims were able because they had a much, a much bigger healthy core. This healthy core protected them. But many, many victims don't have this. Mm. So the, what the narcissist does, he regresses you. The minute you meet you come across a narcissist and you become his intimate partner. He regresses you to early childhood. He becomes your mother, as we said. So he regresses you to early childhood and he leaves you stuck at an infantile stage. You're an infant. When the narcissist is gone, you're an infant. And you need to grow again. You need to go through all, all this process again. We've talked about um, a bit of spirituality before and um... I was wondering, I've watched many, many of your videos, not all of them, that's impossible, but um, do you have any spiritual quality of aspect of your life? Have you had a, any metaphysical experience during your life, during your life journey? Um, or... Luckily, you didn't take the smartphone. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I once gave an interview and there was a guy there and he asked me, so what do you think about consciousness? I said, I don't know. I don't know what is consciousness. No, no, no. What, but what do you think about? I, said, I can't think about something I don't know, uh, which I cannot define. It's not, in the absence of terminology, there's no meaningful discourse. Similarly, I have no idea what is spiritual, so it would be very difficult to answer your question. If by spiritual you mean non-scientific or non-irrational or illogical or some, I don't engage in such things. I don't have time. I'm 62. If by if by spiritual you mean religious, then of course I don't engage in this. this religion is an institutional practice, and um, religion is a particularly poisonous, toxic, and abominable institution in all its forms. No religion accepted. So definitely, I don't engage in this. It leaves the... If I push people who claim to be spiritual, spirituals, if I push them to define it, they would have an extremely... And so finally, they revert to vague generalizations. It's something I cannot explain. It's a personal experience. It's a mystical experience. It's a oceanic feeling. Oh, okay, nice, very nice. I don't do this. I do this when I write poetry. I wrote award-winning poetry. This I do when I write poetry or fiction, not when I give an interview about um, rigorous disciplines such as science or even pseudosciences like psychology. 
there's no place for for indeterminate phrases like spirituality or consciousness or, or even God. Even God is ill-defined. That's the best I can do to, to answer you. I adhere to the scientific method. Of course, it requires faith. You have to have faith in something. So some people have faith in God. I have faith in reason. It's unsubstantiated. There's no way to prove that it's, it works. I mean, it works in reality, but there's no way to prove that it's always correct. So it requires a leap of faith. My faith is reason and rationality. Some other people's faith is Allah or God or whatever. Yeah. That's it. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, let me see. Is feeling empathy towards a narcissist a dangerous luxury no one can really afford? Would you agree? A narcissist is um, a vector of destruction. The equivalent, I think, of a virus or a hurricane. It's a force of nature because we're all part of nature. The distinction between human and natural is, of course, idiotic, counter, mm. counterfactual. We're all part of nature. This tray and this, uh, this kettle, they're, they're natural, totally natural, because everything humans create is natural because they're part of nature. A beaver builds a dam. The dam is natural. So everything is, is uh, natural. The narcissist is a part of nature, and exactly like other destructive vectors, um, should be avoided. I don't know. I I don't know the last time I read about something who empathizes with viruses, or has great great sympathy for for hurricanes. And I don't understand why would anyone empathize with narcissists, or there is the underlying presumption or assumption that narcissists are human. And that leads to a very complicated issue known as the intersubjectivity agreement. Um, I'll try to summarize it in two, three sentences, even if you don't want me. I'm a narcissist, I don't care. So I'll try to summarize in a few sentences. How do I know that you are human? How do I know that you're human? I have no access to your mind. I have access only to one mind. And even that is very limited. And that mind is mine. I have no access to your mind. And even much worse, I have no way to prove or disprove that you have a mind. So I am forced to rely on your self-reporting. But there's a problem there. Self-reporting is mediated by a language. When you say red and I say red, we can objectively agree on a frequency which corresponds to red, but there's no way for, to, for you to communicate to me your inner experience of the color red. So what we do, we create a deception, the biggest deception, by the way, which underlies all other deceptions. This deception is known as empathy. It's a deception. The, the philosophical term for empathy is intersubjective agreement. It's intersubjective agreement relies on a set of um, underlying assumptions. One, because you look like me, outwardly, you are like me. Of course, immediately you can see it's a nonsensical claim. In a hundred years' time, there would be robots or androids or humanoids, or I don't know what you want to call them, who would look exactly like you. The second underlying assumption is, because you look like me and you are me, according to assumption number one, you, your inner processes are identical to, identical to my inner processes. I have no way to substantiate. And the third assumption is, because of all the above, your experience of your inner processes is identical to my experience of my inner processes. All these are, of course, idiotic assumptions, and the intersubjective agreement is an idiotic uh, agreement. Empathy is another word for a set of behaviors and experiences that emanate from the intersubjective agreement. Empathy has three components, reflexive, uh, cognitive, and emotional, and supposedly empathy develops as we age, starting at a very early age. 
as we age, and then finally we reach the pinnacle of emotional empathy. But empathy is not a, is never about you. Empathy is always about me. Even when even if I were to possess empathy, and I'm proud to say that I don't, but even if I were to possess empathy, it would still be about me and not about you. And the reason it would always be about me is that I have no access to you. I have no idea who you are. I don't know what's going on in your mind. I cannot describe. I have no, I know nothing about you, zero. How could I empathize with you? I empathize with my projections. That's what I empathize with. It's about me. It's always about me. Empathy, in other words, is by far the most narcissistic act. By far. Mm. It is totally solipsistic. It's totally isolated from other people. It's assuming for you how you must be feeling. Telling you what are your inner experiences and reacting as if I'm right. I'm always right. When I empathize with you, I'm always right. Um, because empathy is supposed to be non, non-verbal or pre-verbal. I'm always right. You know? um, I will not go now into academic analysis of empathy and so on and so forth. It is not an accident that empathy was invented by Germans. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. The concept of empathy was invented by Germans. And so empathizing with the narcissist has two problems. The narcissist does not exist. It's a force of nature. It's largely inanimate. It has no internal... The narcissist has no internal processes, actually. And so therefore empathizing with the narcissist, even if it were possible, which I claim that is impossible, but even if it were possible, would be empathizing with a non-entity. And that is definitely agreed by everyone to be nonsensical. But even if the narcissist were an entity, empathizing with the narcissist implies that empathy is possible. And I'm saying that empathy is a lie, a deception that we all engage in, pretending that we have knowledge or access to other people, which we don't, ever. Not in the least. Not even 1%. Not even 0%. 1%. Nothing. Zero. I know nothing about you. I have no idea if you're not a robot. Nor can I prove it or disprove it. Nothing. I have to rely on your self-reporting and the fact that you look like me. Well, you don't look like me. I don't want to insult you, but you, you look much better. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So it's basically a, a, yeah, a false simulation of the other person. We would not have survived had we not invented these deceptions, these fantasies, these lies. We would not have survived. The religion, for example, is a must deception. But still... It, it does regulate social interactions to some extent. It does modulate psychological processes to some extent. It has, it has some value. So we engage in it. Empathy is a lie, is a deception. End of story. But we, we accept it, we engage in it. If I, were to, if I were to talk to you strictly as a clinical psychologist, anyone who believes that a Jew was the son of God died and then rose from the dead, has delusional disorder and must be treated urgently with medication. Anyone. But we don't dare to say this because there is value in religion. Political value and and economic value, of course, a lot of money, but also social value. It's social capital of some kind. Same with empathy. But also that's... Taking metaphors word to word, which is simply no. The cr- Christians believe that Jesus really was the Son of God and really rose from the dead. If you go to a Christian and I mean, a true Christian, evangelical, for example, and you tell them that it's a metaphor, he will tell you that you it's sacrilegious and you are blasphemer. Hmm. Even in Catholicism, the the Eucharist, the Eucharist, the the wafer and the wine, they don't symbolize or represent the flesh and blood of Jesus, they become the flesh and blood of Jesus. This process is called transubstantiation. Yes, wow, cannibalism is... (laughs) Exactly. In in church. Okay. Um, Let's go for one last one. what have we missed out on something that's important? Take your time, man. No, no, no. I love the sound of my voice. So. 
plus the view is magnificent. Both views. Yeah, this is important. When you discuss narcissism, narcissistic abuse and their behavior, so on, you talk about clinically uh, diagnosed people. But many of us meet people who are somewhere on the spectrum, maybe higher, lower. How much of this content of your advice is interpretable in these situations? We don't know. Many people are not um, yeah, here, clinically diagnosed. Here, two scholars are the authorities of, on your question. One of, one of them is Lynn Sperry, and the other one is Theodore Millen. Both Sperry and Millen suggested that we should distinguish between narcissistic style, narcissistic personality, or also known as narcissistic personality organization, and narcissistic <coughs> personality disorder. Narcissistic style is being an a-hole, being a jerk. So many people are like that. They're obnoxious, they're arrogant, they're this, they're that. They're not malignant. They don't, they don't have the pernicious effect, the bad effects that I'm describing in my work. Similarly, very few people with narcissistic style, which is the next phase, next level. Narcissistic style simply means that your misbehaviors would characterize all your interactions in all fields of life. They will not be limited, let's say, to the workplace or to the intimate relationships, but they will be who you are. Even there, only a small minority would have such a horrible impact on the lives of their nearest and dearest. And so on. Only people with narcissistic personality disorder have this, have manifest these outcomes. That's why a lot of the content online is rubbish. A lot of it. You had a fight with your husband, he's a narcissist. It's a lot, a lot of it is rubbish. And many, if not all, I would say almost all, the self-styled experts and their self-styled dogs are wrong. Often wrong, catastrophically wrong. It reached the point where a group of academics felt the need to go on to go public on in Washington Post and say that we should ignore, and I was not among them, they said that we should ignore everything online on gaslighting, because all of it is wrong. That's not Sam Vaknin, that's Washington Post and preeminent scholars and so on. We are terrified in academia. At, I'm teaching in universities and so on. I'm teaching in the outreach program of the CS consortium of, of universities, which include, among others, Harvard and Princeton, you know, minor universities. So I'm in touch with all this, uh, with this milieu, international conferences. We are terrified of what's happening on Terrified. Every concept has been corrupted beyond recognition. Every clinical entity has been utterly demolished by nonsense. Every, And you have people with academic degrees in psychology who go online and declare themselves to be experts on narcissism, and yet, the only thing they've ever published was about receptivity to vaccines. That's the only record of anything they've ever published. And yet they, they claim to be experts on narcissism. We have people online who, with academic degrees who have never ever participated in any international conference on cluster B personality disorder, and yet they claim to be experts. This is really bad, what's happening online. But I'm also angry at my colleagues because they won't go on YouTube. It's beneath them. You know, they, they don't dirty their hands. They remain stuck in academia, ivory tower. Yeah. So at least I dirty my hands. I go, I go online and I try to find this tsunami of misinformation and disinformation and nonsense and victimhood uh, identity. And, and, but it's hopeless, of course. I'm, I'm tilting at windmills. There's no way to stop this, to stem this tide. And anyone who tries is... is uh, de-ranked by the YouTube algorithm because the victimhood guys and girls, they get a lot more uh, traffic and generate a lot more advertising for YouTube. So YouTube tends, tends to encourage, foster and disseminate misinformation and disinformation. Had YouTube and the likes, social platforms, not been subjected to political pressure, to this very day, you would have uh, conspiracy theories, terrorism videos and so on, on these platforms because they bring a lot of traffic and they can monetize the eyeballs. Um, no one puts pressure on YouTube to, to ban or block channels with wrong information about narcissism. 
they, they put a lot of pressure to ban and block Donald Trump. So he was banned and blocked. But that's a result of political pressure. For, well, for most of the instances of YouTube, there were open channels of ISIS on YouTube with decapitation videos. For years, for years, four years at least. Only huge, it takes huge pressure to, you know, get rid of, of David Icke was, was on YouTube for well over 10 years. Alex Jones was on, on YouTube and elsewhere with Sandy Hook conspiracies and so on for well over eight years. <clears throat> so they have no incentive. On the contrary, they have incentive to have the kind of toxic, venomous, poisonous, destructive content that attracts viewership because they monetize it by selling advertising. And so we don't stand a chance, even if all the academics... Are there. By the way, if you go online, I'm kidding you not, I, I saw videos by Kohut with 2,000 views. The, I saw videos by Kernberg. The biggest number of views was 20,000. I saw videos by Campbell, who is the current authority on study, experimental studies of Nazism, with Sean Twenge and so on. Campbell got the biggest number, the highest number I've seen was half a million, but most of his videos were like 70,000, 20,000, 10,000. So no one watches these people. They are the authorities. No one watches them. You amongst many. You know, no one watches them. They want to watch. Once I mentioned Kernberg in one of my videos, and a woman wrote to me, Kernberg really has no idea what he's talking about. He should watch some videos by Ramani. I'm kidding or not. I invented the, most of the language, and I invented many of the diagnoses in use today, for example, inverted narcissism. The main test for covert narcissism is built on my work. I, mean, I can show you references after the session. And yet I'm receiving comments. You have no idea about inverted narcissism. You are getting it all. It's a diagnosis I invented. Yeah? You are getting it uh, all wrong. You should watch less cargo. Mm -hmm. Or what wasn't that? This is how bad it is. So it's a lost fight, exactly like misinformation about vaccines or misinformation, conspiracy theories and so on. People despise expertise, reject authority, want nothing to do with anything establishment and anything institutional. The irony is no one can be less establishment than me. I mean, I'm a, I'm a rebel. I did time in prison, if you wish. Call me criminal, no problem. You're a punk. I'm a punk, I'm an antisocial, I'm everything. And yet, I'm now, because I have a title professor in front of my name, I'm now the establishment. You know, I'm punished for being the establishment. Is it maybe also simply people wish to have very simple and easy answers to not really because questions? Not really, because science does provide simpler. For example, if you have COVID, you should get the vaccine. It's extremely simple. But they don't want anything to do with institutions, experts, authorities, and so on. This is, this is a rebellion against the foundations of civilization. There's, there's a, a wish to undermine and destroy the foundations of civilization because there is a perception that civilization has left many people behind and does not provide the solutions anymore. Or that civilization is out of control. Like, why do we need physics? We ended up with nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. Okay, so physics is nice, but now we can all die because Pu crazy Putin would, would drop nuclear weapons in Ukraine. So is was it's it very good? demagogue, though, isn't it? And yeah, but maybe we should. Maybe we would have been better off not having smartphones, but not dying. You know, there, there is an argument there. Mm -hmm. We we mismanage as elites, as members of the elites. We mismanage a lot. We mismanage world peace. We mismanage technology. We mismanage science. We did a, a bad job. Women today have every right to get rid of men because men mis mishandled and mismanaged history for long enough, I think. It is not, not an accident, that, not a coincidence, that feminism started to its ascendance after the Crimean War, the war in Crimea, which was a botched war, a horrible war, for Florence Nightingale and so on, and of course exploded after the First and Second World War, when it was evident how stupid men are and how they can't do anything right. You know? So women said, the hell with it. We're taking over. And of course they're taking over. 
men just men are fighting back, but they don't realize they lost the war. We are headed to a matriarchy. So common average people, they say we don't trust anymore doctors, scientists and so on, because the same people who gave us smartphones gave us nuclear weapons. And the same people who gave us vaccines gave us thalidomide or other medication that kill, kill people. I mean, we can't trust anymore anyone. Also, there is a presumption, just not far from the truth, that money corrupted everything irrevocably and inextricably. I know it from the DSM. The DSM is utterly corrupted by, by money. Utterly corrupted by money. I don't trust the DSM. I don't trust the DSM. I now resort to the ICD, which is the alternative to the DSM in the rest of the world. This DSM in the United States is a, a product of the insurance and pharmaceutical industries. It's heavily corrupted by money. So there is this corruption that you can buy anything and that you can't trust anything because, you know, who paid for it behind the scenes or directly? Even. Most tobacco studies were financed by tobacco industry, the tobacco industry. So should we believe uh, other studies about other issues? I don't know. Even I don't know. In other words, we have entered the age of distrust. It's the age of distrust. In this environment, it's very easy for con artists. Anyone who claims to be an expert on narcissism and published nothing about narcissism and did not participate in any international conference on narcissism is a con artist. And I don't care how many PhDs he or she has. It's a con artist. It's a crook. So there is open space for, for crooks and con artists and, and crazy people, reptilians and I don't know what else. You know. So it's getting worse, worse and worse because people, as an act of rebellion even, they say, in your face, I'm going to believe that reptiles came from another planet and became Queen Elizabeth. I'm going to believe that, not because I believe that, but because it's my way of showing um, kind of resistance, defiance, defiance yeah. resistance. <clears throat> That's my way of showing this. So people are adopting irrational positions, occult positions, conspiracy theories, not always because they truly believe, but because this is the last stand. This is the last, way, the, the only remaining way to fight the encroaching establishment. The state, a typical nation state, a hundred years ago, consumed 3% of gross domestic product in the early 20th century. Typical state consumed 3%. Today, a typical state consumes 60% of gross domestic product. A typical tax code in Bismarck's time, Bismarck was the first to introduce a tax code and, and social pension, <clears throat> social welfare and pension system. A typical code at that time was about 100 pages. The IRS code is 87,000 pages. <coughs> there is a cancerous growth of the nanny state, of establishments, of institutions, and people resent this and reject this and don't want this. They want to have some space, you know. So what can you do to fight off this encroachment, this gradual you know, infestation, if you will? You, you're not a physicist. You're not a scientist, you're not, you're not, so you say, I believe in reptilians. It's my, my But then this is also a form of individuation, isn't it? Yes, I'm, it's, it's part of malignant individualism. I, individualism became an ideology, not individuation. Individuation is healthy. Individualism, okay, it's a malignant ideology which is attendant on individuation. It's like when you become an individual, you suddenly acquire entitlement and rights at the expense of others. That's individualism. So, yes, it's part of malignant individualism. I'm going to inflict damage on my neighbor. I'm going to infect my neighbor with COVID just to prove that I'm independent. I'm autonomous. I have agency. I'm going to kill 10 people in the process, but I'm going to do that because I'm an individual and no one will tell me what to do. No. It's an example. And similarly, people think that if they spread the wrong information about narcissism, it's not really damaging. It's not like, you know, infecting someone with COVID. No, it's much worse. Much worse than infecting someone with COVID, statistically speaking. And if they spread a conspiracy theory about reptilians, okay, it's half joke, half not joke, I don't know. Uh, 
but it wouldn't have real life repercussions until someone kills someone. So there was the incel community, the involuntary celibate community. These are men who claim that they have a right to sex. And if women refuse to give them sex, they should be raped. And you can say, okay, you know, losers, until several of them uh, raped and killed women. There are consequences to every utterance, every speech act has consequences. Nothing is stronger than words. Not nuclear weapons, not, nothing is stronger than words. Words should be used very responsibly and sparingly, and every word should be measured. Even though my videos are strolling and I seem to... Actually, every word is measured, and I, I invest hours of research before I say anything. And I never say anything, I'm not sure of, and haven't checked, cross-checked from a dozen angles. You have a responsibility the minute you open your mouth. And so, but people regard speech acts as uh, inconsequential. People even regard facts as inconsequential. I was on a forum, I've been on a forum, and someone said, the Battle of Hastings was in 1066. Correct, by the way. And then another guy says, no, I think you're wrong. I think it was, uh, I don't know, 1039. Don't know. And the first guy says, no, 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 it was 1066. Here is a reference from the Brit Britannica. Okay, sorry. And the second guy said, that's your truth. <laughs> that's your fact. Doesn't have to be mine. Facts or facts are opinions. Facts are a subspecies of opinion. This post-truth or truthism, or this is so catastrophically dangerous. And so it's life threatening. It's threatening to the species, even in gender studies. So, <clears throat> Let me just open the light. Yeah, I was wondering if you're okay with light. No? I mean, I have a dark figure, but I think we need to. Even in gender studies, even in race studies, self censorship in academia and, and so on is such that it borders on, on uh, deception. So, if I want to introduce a study, for example, what is the distribution of IQ among self-identified people in different races? I self-identify as Af African-American, so okay, you will be included in the study. And now I want to check what's the distribution of IQ. It's a legitimate research question. End of story. But you will never be allowed to do this. And those who tried and they wrote the bell curve, you know, they were penalized severely. Similarly, I want to check whether the brains of uh, women are substantially different to the brains of men. Hint, yes. But this is not a leg uh, you will never be allowed to, to study this. I want to check whether women really, uh, really um, kind of involve emotions in sex. I want to see if, if it's true, this myth or this assumption that women become more emotional in sex, even in one night stands, even in, mm -hmm. I want to test this. I will not be allowed. I will not be allowed. Self-censorship is so tremendous in academia that it's... Uh, and on the other hand, totally unfounded nonsense, like race theory or totally unfounded nonsense, counterfactual nonsense. You know, I read a study, and with this I will finish. Um, I read a study about uh, slavery and, and so on and so forth. And the study said that... Uh, um, what the white man projected an image of the black man and the, never mind, all kinds of nonsense. And then the study said that um, this was a, a, a specifically white phenomenon, white race phenomenon. Now listen, <clears throat> they love to be a, a racist or a supremacist or this, these people yeah. are nuts and many of them should be in prison, not on the streets. I also am a member of a minority in my own country. I'm a Sephardi Jew. For a very long time, we were the blacks of Israel. No one can accuse me of being a racist in any way, shape or form. But I want to tell you this. This was not a white phenomenon. The minute uh, slaves were freed, many of them became slaveholders. When slaves were sent to Liberia, Liberia was a 
country, which supposedly was um, a new country for freed slaves. That's why it's called Liberia, liberation. The minute they went to Liberia, the overwhelming vast majority, 80% of freed slaves sent to Liberia, started to raid the locals and to ship, to ship them to slavery. That was actually the main economic activity of freed slaves in Liberia. 100,000 100, of them were sent. 87,000 were slave, uh, engaged in slavery. Ships, kidnapping, everything. It was not a white phenomenon because most of slave traders were Arab. They were not white, I mean, right, technically. Right. They were not English. They were not. England was the first to abolish slavery. It was the white race that actually stopped slavery. Slavery, I lived in Africa. Slavery was the predominant trade in Africa for centuries before any white man set foot on the, the continent. Of course, white men enslaved people. I'm not saying they didn't. I'm not an idiot. I'm not, you know, of course, they enslaved people. Of course, they did horrible things. But it was not an exclusive white phenomenon. But if you dare to say this, you will lose your job, your tenure, your pension, you'll be penalized, ostracized. You will be subject to death threats, and there is a good, a fair chance that you'll be assassinated. <laughs> this is the world we live in. Famous last words. Famous last words. It's been a pleasure to know you in Budapest. Thank you bury so me, much. Bury me in the, next to the magazine. Thank you so much for this wonderful interview. Thank you, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having me and suffering, tolerating me. Thank you. It says here, stop taking video. I swear to you, my, my, my <laughs> computer. It said, Jesus. It's humiliating me. Yeah. Stop, stop taking it. video. Stop taking video. Oh, God. Yeah. No, it wasn't God. Don't it's my computer. <laughs>